In today's podcast, I'm joined by Yvette Martin, who is a conservation officer at the appropriately named ARC, the charity otherwise known as Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Her fascinating role is to oversee the conservation of rare species of amphibians, specifically frogs and toads in the UK. Two species in particular have the highest level of environmental protection in the UK, the pool frog and the nattered jack toad. But why should we care? Welcome, Yvette, to the ESG podcast. And before you answer that big question, why should we care? Just explain a little bit about ARC, please, and your role. Thanks for having me, Clive. ARC are a UK-based charity, and our real goal is to ensure that our native species of amphibians and reptiles and the habitats that they depend on can survive and thrive. So ARC manages a large number of nature reserves. We've got about 80 nature reserves across the UK. And we oversee a range of conservation initiatives. So we work on species reintroductions. We provide expert advice. We oversee a number of survey programmes. And we work with government agencies to influence policy. 80 80 nature reserves. I mean, how do we actually find out where these are? I mean, will there be one on everybody's doorstep? There won't be one on everybody's doorstep, no. So ARC have a lot of parcels of land, uh, mainly in the south of the country. But we've also started to build up other nature reserves in areas of South Wales, North Wales, Cumbria. And I think that's one thing we're always looking out for. So where we've got uh, rare species of amphibians and reptiles, um, if we have funds available or if we uh, really think that a parcel of land is important to the species, um, we might uh, put something out there to try and raise some funds so that we can purchase parcels of land and grow the number of nature reserves that we have across the country. Where do you find out about yeah all that? So if you have a look on www.arc-trust.org, you'll be able to uh, view some pictures and a little bit of information about each nature reserve and the type of species that you might find there. And just in case anyone needs to check, um, when I was looking up um, ARC, I went A-R-K. It is, of course, A-R-C, but we can come to that towards the end. Before we do that, tell me a little bit more about the pool frog and the natterjack toad in particular. How many are there? now and and at the peak how many would there have been? I can tell you approximately how many we have now. I should say that we've got this information because ARC run national monitoring programs for both species. It's a bit easier for the pool frog because they're only on two sites in the UK so we have a a dedicated contractor who goes out for ARC each year and he does population counts on both sites. Our most recent population estimate for the pool frog is 71 adults, 71 split over two sites. So we've got a slightly larger population on the first reintroduction site, and we're trying to increase the numbers on the second reintroduction site. Mm-hmm. And for Natterjack toads, it's a very big project. So it's spread out all the way from Dorset in the south of England up to Dumfries and Galloway in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And we work with a huge range of partners mm-hmm. to gather data on the numbers of breeding female natterjack toads. So we do that by getting volunteers to go out and count spawn strings. And the most recent estimate that we've got for the numbers of breeding females is 1,225. And that gives us a breeding population of 2,450. So by the sound of it, the natterjack toad is doing better than the pool frog. I had no idea that we had a creature in the UK which was down to its last 71 adult. So it begs the question, how many would there have been before man's intervention in on the land? Is this a species that has suffered as a result of environmental degradation or man or all of those things? So it's really hard to say, if I'm honest, Clive, how many we actually had. Scientists have tried to put a figure on what we had, but because we haven't had structured recording in place, it's really hard to put a figure on that number. If you look at the scientific papers, there's estimates that we've gone through about a 70% decline in the numbers of natterjack toads across the UK. The biggest factors that are affecting the, the population and the range and the distribution of both species are really man. So changes to the environment that might affect where you would find natterjack toads and pool frog, habitat degradation, farming. 
the question was how to save a species. And I suppose before we actually get to that answer, it was how big was the species at the start? I think that's what I was I was trying to drive at. But it occurs to me that I'd never heard of a pool frog until you introduced that name to me. Are these an integral part of the food chain? I'm assuming not, because if there's only 71 adults, they can't really be shaping the environment in which they live very dramatically, can they? Pool frogs were probably much more widespread than we can uh, appreciate now. So the pool frog actually went extinct in England back in 1995. There was a bit of a debate over whether or not pool frogs were native to the UK, so right. they went unmonitored. They do form an integral part of the food chain, as do all species of amphibians. One key thing that you need to consider with amphibians is their multi-stage life cycle. So they have six stages in their life cycles, which is very rare. They've got an aquatic phase and a terrestrial phase. So they form part of the food chain in different kinds of habitats. So in the aquatic phase, pool frogs and natajack toads might be predated on by a number of invertebrates. They might be predated on by fish, by birds. Because you've got so many different species that might use amphibians and the aquatic life stages as food, it's probably not a noticeable change that you would see. But if you were, say, to lose all species of amphibians, it would certainly have a dramatic impact on invertebrate populations, on mammal populations, on bird populations. So ultimately, it's a cumulative effect, isn't it, over time of, of losing a species rather than just one specifically. In this case, you're, you're trying to protect two species of amphibian. And I have to say, when I was younger, I maybe confess, I'll confess to this now to, to the listener, I kept um, frogs born in a jar to see how they were developing. Uh, I wish I hadn't done that now. It would have been better off to have left them where they were. I mean, that, then that's a good point, actually. If somebody comes across some frogs born in a, in a pond um, and they're wanting to encourage their children to take an interest in nature, what would you recommend is the best thing to do? I would say it's best just to leave it exactly where it is. And if you're really keen, you could sign up to one of the survey programmes with ARC and you could go back on a weekly basis and check to see how the, the frog spawn or the toad spawn was progressing. You can do um, tadpole counts. You can look to see how many legs the tadpoles got. You can look to see if you've got toadlets coming out of the pond. So that's a, a very good indicator of a healthy pond the numbers of froglets or toadlets that you might get out. And it gives you a, an indication of recruitment into the population. Now, that's something I didn't think I'd hear when I woke up this morning, a new word. I've never heard of toadlet before, but I'm most grateful. That's terrific. Most of the listeners of this podcast, I would say, are from the business community because they're interested in knowing how to develop their environmental, uh, social impact and corporate governance strategies. That's, that's where ESG comes from. And I'm curious on their behalf to ask you a question. If there was a business out there, and let's say nominally ASDA, how much would it cost to actually ensure that the pond frog was going to survive? Because this is an organisation with tens of thousands of employees who, if they actually put their um, efforts toward it, could give you sufficient money to save a species, which I would think would be you know, a landmark achievement both for any organisation and an individual. Asking a direct question, with probably a bit simplistic, but how much money do you need to save the pool frog? It's a very difficult question to answer because we're going through a, a period of change. Over the next 10 years, we'll see dramatic changes to our countrysides and our coasts because of climate change. And there's some challenges that we don't know how they're going to affect amphibians and reptiles in the UK. The most important thing to consider is that really every penny counts. You can log on to ARC's website and you can sponsor a species. So you can put as little as £100, up to £7,000, and that might help ARC just to keep going as a charity and help us keep doing what we're doing. So that might be overseeing all of the monitoring for rare species of amphibians in the UK. It might be coordinating large groups of volunteers to go out and clear scrub on sites. It might be getting people to dig ponds. It really depends exactly what we want to achieve. A big thing that is becoming more apparent in the conservation world is the concept of favourable conservation status. So that means uh, putting a figure on what we think is a favourable level or numbers in terms of population 
and range and distribution for our species of amphibians and reptiles. Once we've worked out this figure, we'll be more likely to be able to put some kind of cost towards it to say, this is exactly what we want to achieve. This is how much it will cost to get there. And that's something we're working on with Natural England and Scottish Natural Heritage and uh, Natural Resources Wales right now. I suppose trying to break that down, going back to my ASDA um, example, if ASDA were to give you, say, 100,000 to do this, it would be rather than just specifically saving um, the pool frog, but the environment, um, both for it and all the other organisms in the two environments in which they currently exist. Is that right? They wouldn't just be focusing on one specific creature. They'd be focusing really on favourable conservation. Is that right? Have I understood that properly? That is exactly it, Clive. So I think because they are an integral part of the food chain, you really need to think about the ecosystem and all its different influences. So you have lots of different species of invertebrates that use ephemeral water bodies that natterjack toads to use to breed in. Um, so something like the northern dune tiger beetle, it's a rare species of invertebrate. And I think if we weren't creating pools for natterjack toads, you would have very few pools for northern dune tiger beetles. By working on sand dune systems, we make sure that we maintain open areas of bare sand so that you have a, a dynamic system in place. The main thing is, even though we are a charity with a focus on amphibians and reptiles, what we're really trying to achieve is to make sure that the habitats are in as good a condition as possible to support those species. Ensuring we have good quality habitat, you're supporting other species as well. Now, the fascinating message coming from what you've just described, I think, does actually have, it resonates with me quite significantly regarding ESG. Because if as a business leader, you focus perhaps um, on all your attempts to make sure that your environmental impact is as positive as it can be at the expense of perhaps not looking after your supply chain or your relations with the staff, and then you perhaps take your eye off the ball in terms of how is your organization governed? Is it transparent? Is it listening? Is it responding to, to the environment in which it finds itself? ESG breaks down in those environments. And similarly, there is a parallel with the world of conservation, I think. Um, you can't just look at one aspect of conservation at the exclusion of the others. But to try to bring the two ideas together, and that's really why I wanted um, to, to invite you onto the podcast, what would you say to the leaders of organizations and I don't mean just businesses, it could be schools, local authorities, all business leaders. What would you say to them in your capacity as a conservation officer at ARC about their personal responsibility to the environment? Everyone has uh, a responsibility and it might be, you know, it's a corporate responsibility, a social responsibility, an environmental responsibility, but there is a role to play regardless of how small it might be. So if, for example, you can help to support conservation charities across the UK, that might be through donations or setting up days where your employees can go out to volunteer their time, then that's great. It might be something as simple as thinking out about how you can reduce your plastic waste. I mean, these are all things that companies and clients of mine are currently considering. I suppose the point I was trying to drive out of it is that if you're running an organisation you do need to be able to answer the question, don't you? What is our impact on the environment? And what are we doing to minimise our negative effects? Does that make sense? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, so I think that's what I was trying to drive at, that notwithstanding we're talking today about frogs and toads and toadlets, regardless of the business that you're in, you actually do have a direct responsibility to make sure that amphibians wherever the pool frog may live, are kept alive. And so I suppose I asked you a question at, at the beginning, um, or rather I posed a question at the beginning, why should we care? What would happen if the 71 adults of, of the pool frog just suddenly disappeared um, towards the end of the year? Would it change anything? So it might not, it might not change anything in the wider scale. The site where we've got pool frogs, you've still got uh, common frogs, you've still got common toads. But they would there would certainly be an impact on the food chain. Amphibians are an indicator species, um, so they're often referred to as um, the canary in the coal mine. If you start losing um, your amphibians, it's basically a precursor of things to come. 
So you might not feel the impact now, but certainly there's a reason why we've lost um, amphibians from those sites. We need to look to investigate why. I think describing amphibians as a canary in the coal mine is a fantastic way to think about this. And, and as a business leader or as a leader of any organisation, I think it behoves everybody to think, what's the canary in their coal mine, which would demonstrate that actually, whilst everything superficially is running well, they are perhaps not looking far enough ahead at the dangers that they're facing. For the moment, at least, that's all the time, sadly, we've got for this podcast. But as you've heard, if you'd like to save a species, you really can. Please visit the Project Discovery page on the ESG Foundation's website, where we take you direct to some of the UK's most exciting conservation projects, ARC, of course, being one of the ones that we've included. And if you can raise money to keep the conservation work going, and specifically about the poor little pond frog and the toadlets of the Natterjack toad, please get in touch with Yvette directly on ARC's website. The details are there. And as you've heard, these species are critically endangered. They all need our help. And wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever your interest in ESG is, there is something that you can do personally and corporately. So thank you for listening. Do follow the ESG Foundation on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. And if you like this post, please share it with your colleagues. And thank you again, Yvette, for this morning. Thank you.